I am Ilse Saldivar, and I am here to present an unusual case presentation of Kreutzfeldt Jacob disease from the Pain and Headache Center of Texas. Um, and in representation of Dr. Pankaj Satija and Monica Umad, who were the um, initial neurologists involved in the in the diagnostic and care of this of this patient. So we're going to go ahead and get started with a little bit of the history of the patient. So it was a 61 year old female patient of she was married and was a house cleaner. She denied the use of tobacco, alcohol, or any type of drug use. And she was initially brought to the neurologist office uh, for altered mental status. That, that is where we met her. So her family history was only positive for diabetes mellitus. Her past medical history included diabetes mellitus, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and depression as well. So basically her story started off back in August, 2021, where she had, you know, some episodes of confusion. She mentioned them as confusion, not so much memory loss, but, you know, just typical things where she would kind of uh, forget where she uh, placed things or, you know, things that the, the family and her didn't really take into consideration. So this happened from August, 2021, but in November, 2021, from November to December, uh, she started having some real issues, memory issues where to a point where she was driving on the freeway, going to one of her client's house. And um, all of a sudden she lost sense of who she was, where she was going, what she was doing. She just uh, somebody, well, she managed to get, you know, um, off the freeway, but she was really completely lost. So that happened about twice from November to December when that's when the family really realized that something was really wrong. So in December, 2001, she also had an episode where she experienced pain in the occipital region, uh, along with blurriness, confusion, handshaking, vertigo, tinnitus, and left facial numbness. So she was taken to a local hospital where, of course, they considered um, the possibility of a stroke. They did all the stroke workup, and it, all the testing was unremarkable. So now knowing, well, not knowing what the cause of that was, uh, they just suggested she would go with a, a neurologist to, to do further testing. So that's where she went and uh, to the neurologist clinic in January 2022, where is where we met her. And by that time, the memory loss episodes were more frequent. And now she started needing assistance with some daily, um, daily activities. And um, more than anything, she also had a lot of mood disorders. So these were starting to become more prominent. She had aggressive bouts. She was crying for no apparent reason. So all of these things were expressing. So if you see from August 2021 to January 2022, we already have an extensive uh, change in the behavior and memory. So once she went to the neurologist office, we um, we requested the labs, uh, basically um, TSH and all the basic metabolic uh, panel. We requested all the basic labs, I guess you can say. And the only abnormalities we found were the cholesterol. Well, this slide, um, but we already know she had hypercholesterolemia. So, I mean, this was no surprise and it was not really indicative of like anything too um, special, I guess. Um, the only thing we would consider again would be just a vascular or issue. Um, physical examination just showed left dysmetria and a systemic review showed headache, depression, and anxiety. Again, nothing too, uh, too specific for anything. So considering this, of course, we have to have our a differential diagnosis in mind. Like we said, the first thing we thought about was vascular, but there was nothing really indicative of that. Uh, however, we did decide to request an MRA um, just to make sure that we weren't missing anything. And we also considered other etiologies like infectious, uh, toxic metabolic with the labs, autoimmune, metastasis, uh, antrogenic, neurodegenerative, and systemic causes. So initially, we requested an EEG, which didn't really uh, show anything specific. It just was suggestive of diffuse neuronal dysfunction with focal hemispheric asymmetry, which was not really specific of any condition. Um, like I said, we requested an MRA, which was also 
had no um, issues. It didn't show any flow limiting stenosis. Uh, the only thing that we did notice, of course, was that we did the Montreal cognitive assessment test and she scored a five out of 30. So that was very concerning. Obviously, she had a problem. And um, the neuro neurologist decided to start her on Donepezil. However, the patient came back because she had um, the family referred like uh, epileptic uh, uh, seizures, but um, it was determined that it was just kind of more of like an anxiety attack of due to the me medication. So she was taken off that. So now the patient continues to deteriorate as we continue to follow up with her. Her memory loss um, continues to, to aggravate. And now she doesn't know her uh, family members' names. She needs more assistance with her daily life, life activities. So now we request a lumbar puncture. And we requested all the basic uh, infectious and perineoplastic markers and everything. And, um, and finally, we decided to request the T-Tau protein, 1433 gamma and everything um, suggestive of Kreutzfeldt-Jacob, although we were not really considering that diagnosis at that time. So uh, on the follow-up, just to kind of go through her lumbar puncture results, um, the patient, we were talking to her and all of a sudden she had an episode of fecal incontinence during the, the follow-up visit. So we see that, of course, you know, she's deteriorating and the neurologist decides that it's time for her to be hospitalized and kind of get, you know, tested in a faster manner. Uh, like we saw in the previous slide, uh, basically all the all the markers that we requested and that we got the results of were negative. So uh, we were just waiting for the Kreutzfeldt-Jacob markers um, after. So the day that she was hospitalized was on May 19th, 2022. And this is the only abnormalities that were found. So we see the creatinine has increased from her um, previous one in March. And um, hemoglobin, hematocrit, and albumin are low. So they did a urinalysis, and it was determined that she did have a UTI. So, of course, thinking about an infectious cause to, to this issue, we started giving her, well, they started giving her um, antibiotics for the UTI. And, um, but despite the treatment, she did not, her mental status did not improve. So she continued to um, exhibit emotional lability, prosopagnosia, and was a only able to respond in stereotypical phrases. A renal ultrasound was done and nothing was found. Again, you know, after the treatment and after giving her IV fluids and everything, we see that her labs have uh, mildly improved. Of course, the urine culture is positive for E. coli, but her hemoglobin and everything keeps uh, continues to decrease. It might be associated to the infection. We're not really sure why it was uh, it continued to decrease. So by this time, we finally get the results back for the lumbar puncture that we did back in, um, in the 4th of, of May. And we see that the glucose for the lumbar puncture is mildly increased. The T-tail protein is obviously very increased. And so is the 14.33 gamma. So um, those are extremely high values. And we see that the RT quick neg uh, test though is negative and there are no prions detected at the time. So this was a little concerning because of course she had some of the labs positive, but not the full, not the full panel. Again, the physical examination, now the patient is getting harder and harder to, to kind of examine it just because she is not cooperative at all. But you can still tell that she has some good force, so she doesn't uh, have any observable myoclonus or anything like that. But she does continue to have confusion, and the patient just continues to have, you know, she's laughing out throughout the morning rounds whenever they're trying to examine or ask her questions. She's just laughing out of ne uh, for nothing. So again, they, they send out more testing and they do a new MRI. But in this case, we see that um, now there is some exhibition of cortical ribbing in the frontal, parietal, and occipital lobes, especially on the right side. And there's also some abnormalities in the right anterior striatum. So these, all these findings were not present at the time, like I said, in December when they did the first MRI or anything, the... Everything was normal except for for uh, a little bit of cerebral atrophy. But other than that, this was not present. So now we're starting to see that the markers are, are present, at least half of them. And so is the, the typical MRI. The EEG, uh, it had some abnormalities. 
but in the end, it still did not have, you know, the characteristic bipeds or triphasic waves uh, with the frequency of 1 to 1.5 um, hertz that were normally expected in the patients with Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. So at this point, she is diagnosed with Creutzfeldt-Jakob, regardless of whether all the markers are present or not. So um, the neurologist in charge in the hospital requested the PR100 antibody um, from London. However, since it was just a six patient trial, the patient was not able to, to get a dose. Um, so her only option now at this point was basically to be admitted to hospice. So the family was, you know, talked to and everything, and she was admitted to hospice and the patient expired eight months later. So what is important about this case? So if you notice, um, well, what we know in general about Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is that it's obviously a very uncommon condition. So obviously it's not something that we consider initially as a differential diagnosis. We always kind of leave it toward the end because we only see about one to 1.5 cases per million per year. So we have three types, the familial, which is autosomal dominant, which is not very common, the iatrogenic, which is not very common, and the spread type, which accounts up to 85% of the cases. So the sporadic type, the most, common one, the most common ones we have, well, we can still subdivide it into six subtypes. The two most common ones are the MM1 and MV1, and the least common ones are MM2 and VV1. So what can we see or what can we expect in patients with CJD? So the average age of onset is normally from anywhere from 45 to 70 years old, but the average age of onset is actually at 60 years old. Uh, the patients have very nonspecific symptoms, which makes it hard to diagnose, of course, because they can have stuff like headache, malaise, cough, dizziness, and the more characteristic things are change in personality, mood, or memory. But of course, we can have this with other dementias. So again, it's very nonspecific. The age of the duration of, or, or the onset of the disease itself starts goes for anywhere from two months to seven months, and patients normally die within the first six to eight months. So I mean, once they actually get diagnosed, which takes a long time. They really don't, don't live very long after that. And how do we diagnose? So the CSF protein assays, so we test for, um, so we test for the, like the ones that we saw, the 14, three, three gamma, the T tau protein. Um, we also do the RT quick um, test, but all of these, th uh, all of these markers, of course, we can see in other and other types of uh, neuronal damage. So they're not very uh, sensitive or specific. However, if you uh, put them together with you know different markers, then we can kind of get more of an idea of that it's Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. MRI has a higher sensitivity and specificity. It has about 91% uh, sensitivity and 95% uh, specificity. And of course, the cortical ribbing is the most common uh, finding we'll, we'll see. We have... Um, we have the affection of the cerebral cortex itself, which is the most common finding, but we also have, uh, you know, findings in the basal ganglia. And of course, the EEG uh, changes. So the EEG is very interesting because although we, uh, we know that the periodic sharp wave complexes are the most common finding, they're only found in about 66% of the patients. So considering this, um, we should know that it, it also has this very low sensitivity, only about 37%, but a very high specificity of 100%. So if we see a patient with a positive EEG, you can be certain that it is CJD. So what are the, uh, like I said, the most uncommon uh, subtypes of CJD are the VV1 and MM2. So the VV1, the characteristics of it is that it usually presents at an earlier age. So like I said before, the typical age of onset is 61 years old. Here in VV1, we see that it's normally about 44 years old. And the disease duration, like I mentioned, the other one is very short, anywhere from you know two to seven months. Here we have up to 21 months. So there's a big difference. We also see that these patients normally have an elevated 1433 and total tau in the CSF, which is expected, of course, but they have, you know, the absent uh, typical EEG findings. So the, C the RT quick is typically negative in these VV1 cases. So that's kind of similar to the case that we, we have. And actually, interestingly enough, the VV1 um, cases, only four have been reported in the world so far that, well, that are documented at least. 
So the MM2 variant, this one is uh, more characteristic of having, you know, an increased S100B protein. Uh, they also have the 1433 um, protein test and the EEG. Uh, the patients only have uh, the char characteristic findings only in about 42% of the cases. So again, the patients here, they have the typical dementia, but it's more characterized by having spatial disorientation, aphasia, or apraxia. So considering all of this... Five minutes. Yes. Considering all of this, uh, we should know that the current sensitivity of the CSF for the RT quick is about uh, 92% with a specificity of 100%. So we see that it's very, very specific. However, the RT quick does appear to have a lower sensitivity in patients with the variants MM2 and VV1. So according to a study in, uh, done in 2020, individuals with a prion disease and a, and a negative RT quick results were younger and had a lower tau levels and non elevated. 1433 levels compared to the RT quick positive cases. So as we see, um, these findings are, are very contrary to the to the what we have seen with our patient. So although she did have a RT quick negative test, um, she was older. She had very elevated levels of tau and uh, and 1433 gamma. So. Um, this patient's presentation basically did not align with the most common subtypes, but it also differed from the uncommon types. That's why it's a typical presentation. And um, so contrary to what has been seen, like I, I mentioned, you know, the patient was of older age and she had extremely elevated levels, of both the T-tau and 1433 gamma. So um, this patient also uh, received palliative care and lived 18 months since the initial symptom onset. So as we see, she did have a longer uh, disease course, which is also, on, well, you know, typical of the atypical cases. And um, so given this patient's presentation, well, this may suggest that we have varied sensitivity to RT quick across the CJD types, subtypes, which is starting to, you know, be studied. And although this patient's subtype was not confirmed, it can give insight to a certain marker patterns that each subtype can possibly present with. So it's important to know that, of course, CJD, like I mentioned, is very hard to diagnose. And once, you know, the patient is diagnosed, um, doctors don't really go that extra step to try to find the subtype or there's no time for that. So at this point, I think that it would be worthy, you know, to kind of... Um, focus on trying to, if we do ever run into a CJD case, to try to, to find the subtype because specifically these subtypes we see that have longer lifespan. So we can try to find, you know, maybe a treatment focus on specifically on those patients that would allow us, you know, to do it in the, you know, in, in them just surviving a longer period of time. So, um, that is my presentation here. Uh, I don't know if you guys have any questions. I'd be more than glad to answer.